Hi, I'm Ashton, and after I like edit and upload a video, I very, very rarely go back and watch it. There are two exceptions to that rule. Um, one is when I miss my boyfriend and I just watch all the videos that he's in. Um, and two was a couple nights ago when I went back and I made a playlist for all my top surgery stuff and I watched the recovery videos because when you're on painkillers, you don't remember that. So I went back um, and kind of just reflected on that recovery process, you know, now that I'm six months out, seven months out, whatever it's been. And there were a couple things I wanted to talk about because there were a couple things that I was thinking about that I feel like I never talked about while I was actually recovering, but now that like I think about them, they were things that played into it. So I made like a kind of listy thing as I was watching the videos. I watched the one or three days post-op, I watched the week post-op, I watched like a month post-op, and then I watched a consultation video, which I, ha you know, I haven't seen any of those in like six months because I don't watch things after I edit them. And it was, it was weird. It was odd looking back at it, but it was also kind of like, oh, I went through that, you know, that happened. The first thing um, that like I noticed in the videos that I never talked about was stretch marks. Quite a few people like commented on them and it was rarely anything like fucking rude. It was just kind of like, oh, have you always had, you know, stretch marks there? And yes, in middle school, I struggled with disordered eating a lot and I was very skinny for too long. So when I was forced to eat healthier, um, I gained weight fairly fast. Um, so I have stretch marks on my thighs and on my hips because um, if thick thighs save lives, then like I am an anti-genocide machine. Um, <laughs> and I guess I just never like addressed it, but yeah, I have stretch marks on my chest. They've been there like since I grew a chest. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. They have faded a lot. Um, I think they did get, you know, kind of darker and more obvious after surgery because, you know, they did have to manipulate my skin so much. Um, and therefore probably stretch it around a little bit. I don't know, I'm not a surgeon. Yeah, they, they did become more obvious after surgery, but they have lightened up now and I can't see them unless like I look for them, but I will put in a video here and you might be able to see them. I don't know, um, depends how good I am at attempting to video that part of my body. But yeah, the stretch marks on my chest are like pretty much white now. Um, and they were kind of a reddish after surgery. But, but yeah, you can't see them anymore unless you look. The ones on like my hips and my thighs are still red. So I don't know if that's just because like my weight in my thighs and my hips is where I carry my weight and that weight like fluctuates. Whereas my chest hasn't changed size in six months now, you know? Yeah, that's stretch marks. I also wanted to talk about the drain sites because I complained a lot about the drains in my recovery videos, but I feel like I very rarely update you guys on the drain sites. Um, but honestly, the drains were one of the most annoying parts of recovery. I'm not sure that I ever talked about, like, the type of drain that I had. Um, my surgeon uses a drain called a Penrose drain, which is really just a kind of rubber silicone tube, like, that is round. It looks like a penne pasta noodle that sticks out your sides. I have pictures of them that I can put in here, but that's the type of drain that I had, and for the majority of top surgeries that I've seen other people getting because, you know, the internet exists. Um, they have a drain that is known as a Jackson Pratt drain. It is the ones with the bulbs that collect fluid as it comes out of tubes that are somewhat similar to Penrose drains. But the Penrose drains are open drains, like there aren't balls at the end of them that collects fluid. So you, I had to constantly use like maternity pads on the sides of my chest um, to collect fluid that would come out of them. Like I don't imagine it was any um, more messy than Jackson Pratt drains would have been. But yeah, I had Penrose drains um, and not the bulbous Jackson Pratt type, um, which did, I feel like, help me feel more normal after surgery because um, I didn't get the drains out for like one and a half or two weeks. Um, and I couldn't have imagined having Jackson Pratt drains that long. But the Penrose ones really didn't bother me all too much. Um, but what I want to talk about is the scarring from that. So kind of no matter what type of drain you have, you're probably gonna have some sort of scar. And you know, Penrose drains and any type of drain I imagine just is literally a hole in your body where fluid can come out. You know, there was a big hole through my chest 
which sounds odd saying it, but like, it's normal, I promise, that's what surgery does. And your body heals from like the inside out. So like the outside part of those drain sites are gonna be like the last part of the drain to heal. Um, so it did take some time, but the scars for my drain sites now are almost not noticeable. Like the scars under my pectoral muscles are like way more noticeable and like the drain scars don't bother me at all. Um, I'm gonna show you pictures of each compared to what it looked like when the drain was in. Um, one of the sides was a lot more irritated than the other, believe it or not. Same side as I had all the complications, big surprise. Um, so that scar is a little bit bigger and it is a little bit darker, which I'm not surprised about at all. Um, but like the other side, the scar is almost my skin color now and it is very small um, and both of them are raised, but I also, I tend to have hypertrophic scars like on my arms and even on my chest. But yeah, those scars healed up really nicely and I feel like in my, you know, this many months post-op videos, I never talked about them, so I just kind of wanted to address that and mention that in this little reflection type video. Another thing I wanted to kind of talk about was how foggy my memory is of all of that. Like, the first four-ish days, I barely remember, like, my boyfriend came to visit, barely remember that. Like, I know he did, and I know that I should remember it, but it was the day after surgery, you know? Like, I don't... I don't remember that, um, and I wish I did, but I, I do not. I feel like that's kind of obvious, but it's something that just messes me up. I don't like not being able to remember things, so, you know, watching those videos back for me was like such a, huh, I guess that happened, don't remember that happening, but I guess that happened. Um, I don't know, I guess just it's just very foggy because of painkillers and all the pain I was in despite them, so I think that was like the main reason why watching back those videos was such an odd experience for me. One of the questions that I get and have gotten the most about top surgery and transition in general is like, I want to transition, I want surgery, but I'm scared of the pain. And I've answered it before, but I feel like this is another good place to talk about it. I would like very, very strongly encourage you to not let the fear of pain hold you back from transitioning. If you're disabled in some way that makes surgery harder for you, then definitely talk to your surgeon about it and make sure they're aware and everything because there are things that you can do to help with that. But if you're an able-bodied person and you can healthily get surgery, I wouldn't worry about the pain. It has been so worth it for me and now that, you know, I'm six months out, like, I remember that I was in pain, and I know I was in pain, like, I was very, very sore for quite some time. But in all honesty, what I remember more is how inconvenient it was. Like, the inconvenience of having to wear a binder and of having to wear button-ups for such a long time, that's what was more of a bother than the physical pain was. Um, if you're worried about the physical pain, I really wouldn't let that hold you back. It would suck to keep living with dysphoria simply because you're scared of something that you may, may not even remember in the long run. Like, painkillers exist for a reason, and you're under anesthesia, and you get to talk to the anesthesiologist before surgery, and in most cases, I'm sure. It does hurt, yes, I'm not gonna lie and say, you know, it was painless, um, but like, it wasn't the worst pain that I've ever been in in my life, and I don't like vividly remember the pain, and I, I just really wouldn't recommend letting the pain hold you back if you do think top surgery would help you. The next thing I want to talk about is um, binders and why I never gave mine away. There are a lot of reasons for this because I talked about wanting to give away my binders before I even got surgery, um, and I know some of you were like looking forward to that, but like mm, it ended up being so much more complex than I thought it would be. Like I felt really bad because I would just be giving away binders that fit me and not everybody is my size and I feel like people would have felt really, really excluded um, because I only have, you know, one size of binders and ordering more in like every size would, would be a lot of money that I, you know, don't have on top of shipping and everything. But there are like so, so many ways that you can get binders for free. There are a lot of programs out there where you can get a binder if you aren't financially able to and I'm gonna link some of those down below. I almost feel guilty, not because I didn't do it, but because if I did do it, I feel like it wouldn't have been enough. So I gave a couple of my binders to a friend that isn't out yet. Um, I still do have some of them, but I think I'm gonna donate them to a local center for LGBT youth where they, you know, will literally give binders to kids that need them. I would like to give them to you guys, you know, that, that would be great. But if I ever do something like that, I really want it to be 
more inclusive. You know, all my binders were like nude white people colored. And if I ever give away binders, I'd want to give them away in a range of sizes at the very least, and hopefully a range of colors. I just felt like if I ended up giving them away, it just wouldn't be inclusive and I would feel kind of bad about it. But again, I'm gonna be linking all of the kind of free binder programs that I know of down below. That being said, if you can afford a binder, please don't use those programs because those are actually going towards trans people that can't afford it or can't access it. So keep that in mind, but I those will be down below for your researching pleasure. Another thing I wanted to hit was the term FTM, because being trans is kind of seen as like binary by default, which sucks. Um, I don't think there should be a default, you know, but that is just how it is, I guess. If people did find me through top surgery, I probably seemed like a binary trans guy. You know, I never talked about getting top surgery as a non-binary person. I just kind of talked about getting top surgery as me. And I am non-binary, so it is getting top surgery as a non-binary person, but I talked about it from my perspective um, rather than like the perspective of just a non-binary person. But I feel like the implication with surgery is so binary and that really, really sucks. And I don't have any like insightful comments on that. I just wanted to say um, that sucks and uh, surgery isn't binary because people aren't binary. Um, the last thing that I wrote down and the last thing I wanted to address was the statement slash the idea that I will never look cisgender. Um, because I feel like when I say that, people are like, oh no, 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 your chest is so flat, your results look great, you know, testosterone's doing you wonders. And I'm like, I never said that was a bad thing. <laughs> like when I say I will never look cis, that's not me being degrading, that's not self-hate, that's me saying, I'm not cisgender, so I will never look cisgender, and I'm okay with that. Just because my body doesn't fit into a cisgender normative, that doesn't mean it's not a good body, and my body doesn't have to be cis-passing to be okay and good and loved and decent. <laughs> I'm not saying that as a, oh, I wish I looked cis, I'm saying that as a, I don't look cis and I never will, and I've accepted that because I'm myself and I look trans because I am trans. So yeah, those were just a few reflections I have on, you know, top surgery recovery and some things surrounding it that I feel like I didn't talk about while I was recovering, um, or some things that I just thought about while I was watching those videos. Yeah, I hope this video wasn't too rambly. I know I talked about a lot of different things, but none of these things were things that I could really dedicate a whole video to. So I did this instead, and I feel like it probably worked out okay, maybe, hopefully. Um, goodbye. I hope that you are happy and comfortable with your body, regardless of how it looks to other people, and I will talk to you later, maybe.